All right, let's get started. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, this talk is about SIGSTOR, SIGSTOR, the past, the present, and the future. My name is Dan Lawrence, and up here is Bob Calloway. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm Bob Calloway. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, I'm working on uh, various supply chain projects. I'm also one of the uh, members of the technical steering committee for SIGSTOR. Awesome. So thanks for joining us right before lunch today and delaying your lunch a little bit. Um, we're going to be talking about SIGSTOR. SIGSTOR is a new Linux Foundation project to help improve software supply chain security through transparency. We're going to talk a little bit about supply chain security, but this is one of like a hundred talks about that topic, this KubeCon, so I don't think we need to spend too much time on that. Uh, was anybody here at Supply Chain Security Day a few days ago? Okay. Yeah, a lot of familiar faces here in the back. Uh, we're going to be going over the history of SIGSTOR, where it started uh, a few, it was earlier 2021, but uh, yeah, it feels like a couple months, but it's been a long time now. Um, some of the work we've done along the way, and uh, we're going to do some demos showing how all the different components of SIGSTOR fit together and can be used with a couple real-world examples relevant to KubeCon. Um, uh, we're going to cover some of the architecture. There's some complicated uh, hand-wavy spaghetti drawings, but we'll break them down piece by piece and show how they all fit together. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the work we have planned in SIGSTOR going forward. So yeah, one slide here, uh, one obligatory one on supply chain security before we can move on. A bunch of scary figures, graphs going up and to the right. Um, these are both from the recent Sona type report. Um, a 650% increase in software supply chain attacks and open source in 2021. Uh, these things aren't slowing down. Um, I think the EU predicted another 400% increase next year. Um, lots of attacks are happening. This is very scary, but thankfully a whole bunch of projects, a whole bunch of people here at uh, KubeCon, a whole bunch of people in the cloud native ecosystem are working on helping protect open source and protect software supply chains. So like I said, SIGTOR's mission statement is to really help improve uh, software supply chain transparency. Um, we're doing this through software signing and provenance. Uh, when we originally started the SIGTOR project, uh, we took a lot of inspiration from Let's Encrypt. How many people here use Let's Encrypt every day? Pretty much everybody here. If anybody remembers what the internet was like before Let's Encrypt, uh, most... <laughs> Does anybody remember that? No, a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, nothing was encrypted. Um, everything was insecure. It was because you had to go buy complicated uh, X509 certificates from certificate authorities. You had to pay with credit cards. It was expensive. You had to email things back and forth. You had to figure out what folder to drop them in in your server. It was a giant pain. Um, and so Let's Encrypt came along and thought, um, we can solve this with automation, we can solve this with transparency, and we can solve this with open source. And so Let's Encrypt uh, pushed some new standards, they built a whole bunch of tooling and infrastructure and made it free, easy, and automatic to get secure certificates for your website. And so now you can drop you know, one config line into your Kubernetes YAML pretty much and get uh, encrypted traffic over the internet. And as a result, pretty much everything is encrypted now. Uh, I don't remember the last time I saw one of those red X's in Chrome when I hit a website. Um, they've driven uh, this to ubiquity by making things easy and free and transparent. Um, and so we thought we'd try to do the same thing in SIGSTOR, but for code signing. Um, when you're talking about supply chains, um, it's a lot of the same problems. Uh, there are code signing certificate authorities, um, but they're expensive and they're not automated and it's hard to get them, it's hard to renew them, it's hard to fix things when they expired. So we copied the Let's Encrypt playbook of trying to automate things, make them free, and make them easy, and try to get people signing the code that they release on PyPy and on container registries and Maven Central and all the different open source repositories. And so far, uh, the reception has been amazing and uh, the Let's Encrypt playbook does work is what we're finding. Uh, so I'm going to go over some of the history of the technology behind SIGSTOR here too quickly um, because we rely on a lot of things that have been developed over the past couple of decades in computer science. Uh, some of the first things that started here were certificate transparency logs. Um, these were really introduced widely ac across the web uh, back in 2014, so not even a whole decade ago. Um, but what transparency logs allow uh, us to do in the web and internet, with internet and browsers is to put things uh, in a central ledger where everybody can watch them. Um, if you're a company uh, that uses CAs to get certificates for your browser, you can monitor these transparency logs to make sure that all of the certificates issued for your company's domain name are in there and are correctly issued so that nobody can have an incorrect one and be masquerading as your company or spoofing your traffic. Um, so mistakes happen. The point of transparency logs is to capture those mistakes on record so you can find them later, 
recover from them and mitigate from the bad things that do happen. We can't prevent mistakes from happening. It's about getting these things on the record so you can detect them and recover from them quickly. Um, a couple years later, uh, Google team open source Trillion, uh, which is a database uh, that uses um, tr the transparency logs as a core primitive. Um, so there are a bunch of applications of Trillion, but many of them are powering the exact transparency logs that are used when you request certificates in your browser today. Shortly after that, uh, people started thinking about how to use transparency logs for things other than internet traffic and X509 certificates. Um, Mozilla published a paper called Binary Transparency for Firefox. Firefox is a very popular web browser. It was at the time, and Mozilla was taking it seriously five or six years ago, way before anybody else was. And they were working on some techniques to use transparency logs the same way they were used uh, for certificates to actually protect the Firefox browser update process. Um, so there's a white paper here, and it had some pretty cool ideas on how to do this by piggybacking on the existing certificate transparency logs so it wouldn't need to run any extra operational infrastructure. Uh, Brandon Phillips, another cloud native friend, um, published a project called Arget uh, right after that in 2019, uh, kind of more generalizing that idea of putting things in a transparency log um, and again reusing the existing certificate transparency logs. Arget would download things from a URL and make sure that the contents hadn't changed by putting the mapping of the URL to the digest of the contents in that URL in one of the existing certificate transparency logs by issuing a certificate through Let's Encrypt uh, and then uh, stuffing that metadata inside of the certificate. So it was a really clever hack. Unfortunately, certificate transparency logs weren't meant for that. So the existing CT log infrastructure, uh, people politely asked him to not do that and stand up his own infrastructure instead of uh, abusing or piggybacking on uh, the CT logs that power web traffic. Um, so uh, Brandon started on a, a couple other ideas here, and we worked with him to start a more general transparency log called Recore. That was really the start of the SIGSTOR project, uh, mid-2020, mid to early 2020. Um, so instead of piggybacking on the existing infrastructure, we ran our own instances of Trillion um, as a public benefit. So anybody can put entries in here, and anybody can verify entries in this uh, instance of Trillion. Um, put a bunch of other pieces and tools together uh, around March of 2021, um, so some tooling to interact with that transparency log, um, and some container-specific tooling as well that we'll do some demos of later. Um, a bunch of the components have started to mature rapidly. 2021 is where supply chain uh, kind of took off and hit the mainstream. Um, and we've got a, a whole bunch of different public uh, services that are running that are stabilizing as we go. Um, the cosign tool itself, um, which is for signing and verifying containers, hit a 1.0 or GA release uh, back in July. Um, and the transparency logs that it interacts with um, are going to be moved to beta any day now. Um, so here's some stats on the community, the activity that we've seen. It's really been amazing, all of the support from everybody uh, in advancing the SafeStore project. Um, across all the different repositories and projects we've had basically since just March of this year, um, there have been 820 commits, over 100 contributors as of yesterday, um, 20 different organizations or companies participating. Um, it's really an awesome vendor neutral, multi-company, all the goodness of open source uh, that's allowing SigStore to get to where it is today. Um, the transparency log I just checked yesterday has almost a million, so three quarters of a million entries in it so far, which is awesome to see too. So here's the very complicated spaghetti and wavy drawing uh, that I talked about before. We're going to break this down into the three different pieces, so you don't need to understand everything right now, um, and with some demos too. So I'm going to do some demos showing how to uh, sign a container and then verify that container all the way back to the source code it came from, even through a base image. I think we're getting that feedback again. Cool. There we go. Um, and we're going to show how all these things fit together, too. And then Bob is going to do a demo that breaks it down even farther, showing how to do all this in Bash without even using the tooling that we've built. All right, so here's the first demo. Let me get out of here. Um, I've got a couple tabs open first. Um, this is a simple Go application. It's in a GitHub repo here. Um, this is a basic Hello World Go application. Just prints Hello World. It is containerized using a tool called Co. Does anybody use Co to build Go applications? Cool. <laughs> Co fan club in the back. Um, so this runs in a GitHub action. Um, it builds a container in Co and publishes it to ghcr.io. Uh, this whole process is signed um, and verified using ambient credentials that are present in the GitHub action itself, using an awesome GitHub SigStore integration that we work together on. 
Um, so you don't need any secrets in here. There are no credentials. This is all short-term stuff that's handled automatically by GitHub. One of the cool benefits of this is that the credentials are bound to the exact run of the action itself. Um, so this GitHub action can run every time something is committed. It can run manually. Each run will get its own unique set of credentials that are um, signed by GitHub. And so we can track things down, not just to the repo they came from, to the exact invocation of the action. So we can figure out when it ran, exactly which commit triggered it, um, who pushed that commit, all of that goodness. Um, this uh, uses just the normal co file, which bases your Go application on top of distroless. Uh, Distrolist is a set of lightweight base images um, designed for containers. Um, does anybody here use Distrolist? A bunch of people. Um, even if you don't know that you use it, you're probably using it uh, because our friends here in the Kubernetes City Release Group moved the Kubernetes images over to Distrolist by default. So if you're running a Kubernetes cluster, you probably have Distrolist in there, whether you know about it or not. Um, and luckily enough, these distroless images are also built and signed and have all of the provenance associated with these builds inside of the ReCore transparency log. So in this demo, we're gonna start with the application base image itself, follow that back to the commit that signed it, um, and then jump all the way to the base image from that as well and follow that back to the job that built and signed that base image. So let's open up the terminal here and start typing some commands. Bob has them all saved for me. We're going to do it live. All right, so we're going to start by setting the experimental environment variable because this uses the experimental features of a transparency log. And we're going to verify the image itself. It is a ghcr.io, the name of my GitHub repo. And we're going to do some JQ magic here. So this fetches the signatures and downloads all the, it verifies the signatures and dumps the provenance information here so we can figure out exactly where it came from. Uh, the JQ command formats it nicely. We can scroll up and see a couple different entries here. We can see that it was signed by this subject. So this is the fancy GitHub SIG store direct integration that I was talking about before. So we can see that this is a token that was signed by GitHub down to this exact GitHub repository, um, the exact action inside of it and it ran on main. And this is the exact commit that it ran at. Um, so we can take a look at that commit. If we want to come back here, which one was it? E, oh, wrong repo. Yeah, that is the last commit here, the E041. Back to the terminal. Now we're gonna take a look at that image itself using the crane tool, which uh, is designed for working with registries. We're gonna look at the manifest, the actual OCI manifest of that image itself. Pipe that to JQ as well. And this is how we're gonna find the base image. Um, so the OCI specification recently added a standard annotation where build tools can place the base image that an image was built from. So we see these two things here. So this was built from the distroless static image at this digest. So that's how we're gonna jump back over to the base image and start looking up signatures there. So we're gonna take that digest. We don't need to know anything about how this was built. We just need to know the digest of the container itself. We're gonna search in the transparency log for that digest. And do some shell magic. We've got a bunch of entries here. Um, so the reason there's a bunch of entries here is because the distroless images are actually reproducible. There's about 50 images, 50 variants of the images for different architectures that are built from the same repo and they all rebuild every time a commit is pushed. Since it's reproducible, we get the same exact digest unless something actually changed for that specific image. So here we actually have a bunch of runs reproducing that image itself, which is pretty cool. So if we take one of these, we can fetch that from the log and start breaking apart the response more. This is hitting the transparency log, a couple more JQ incantations. And we can see a lot more JSON here, but this is the exact provenance. So the provenance contains information about how the image was built. Um, and this is captured by the build system. Um, so this is an automatic build system using Tecton CD. Um, this captures things like the inputs to the build, the exact containers that ran in order. So from those inputs, which were the source code, um, the exact containers that ran with their digests, 
the commands that ran inside of those containers, and all the way up to the final images that got built. So we can see the commit that it was started at in the distro list repository. We see the container that ran, we can see those entry points, um, and we can trace this all the way back to that commit itself. Uh, but why stop there? We can actually start to look up signatures on the commits. Um, do people sign their commits? How many people sign commits? Exactly. Not too many because it's really hard to do and it's hard to look up the signatures and actually do anything with them. So there's some cool demos and hacks that we've done on SigStore where you can actually sign commits and instead of putting them in the Git repository, you can put those signatures in the transparency log as well because a commit is just a long string. So I signed these commits in the DistroList repository and in the Hello Co repository, and you can look up signatures for that commit as well in our transparency log. So we've got that here. Let's get the information for that entry, and we should see my email address in here. Rip this apart a bit, we've got a certificate, we're gonna pipe that through OpenSSL and we should see a subject information. Awesome. And that is my Gmail address here. So this is the rest of the certificate. This was issued by the certificate authority that we operate for free as part of the SigStore project. Um, so my personal account signed the commit in the DistroList repository, and we verified that backwards all the way from the code in the base image to exactly the systems that it was built on, all the way up to the application image and the exact system that was built on. So these are systems in different GitHub organizations. Uh, one was using GitHub Actions, one was using Tecton. So we've traced these across build systems, across organizations, uh, from source code all the way to running container. Cool, and that is the end of this demo. I'm gonna hand it back over to Bob. Awesome. Oh, thanks, Dan. So as, as Dan mentioned, there's many moving pieces involved here. Um, I'm gonna kind of do a deep dive into three of those components, and the first one's um, called Fulcio. And so this is the certificate authority um, that is serving as a couple different roles. But number one, it's, it is the, um, the CA that you're going to go to to get a code signing certificate. Um, and it's gonna have that identity information um, that Dan just showed off with his Gmail address um, embedded in that certificate. So rather than just having the bare public key to verify the signature, you're actually gonna have this certificate um, that will contain extra information about whose identity, was, who was the signer, who actually vouched for that signer. Um, and in the case of his email address, it was actually Google. Um, but we also do integrations with uh, Spiffy Spire. So we can actually have the workload identity actually um, you know, be recorded in the certificate as well. So there's kind of a, there's a, obviously with OIDC, it's built on top of OAuth, and so there's a multi-legged flow that happens behind the scenes. But um, in, in essence, Fulcio uh, is issuing uh, certificates, and it actually has a transparency log that runs as a part of its deployment as well. So you can think of that as providing key transparency to say, hey, at this point in time, um, we have a certificate that's being granted, we had a valid identity token, which was vouched for by a particular provider, and all of that is now stored in an immutable ledger. So we can walk that back at any point in time uh, to verify the validity of the signature, the validity of all the timestamps, all of that can be put together, and, and Fulcio acts as that authority that can tie all this um, uh, together. Now, we've got kind of two different modes. One is, you know, if anybody here has ever tried to manage uh, their own PGP keys, it's not the easiest thing to do in the world. And I think, frankly, that's one of the biggest inhibitors to actually people signing software is just key management's too darn hard. Um, so, you know, one of the things that the, the team has been working on is something we like to call keyless mode. Now, obviously, there are still keys involved because we're doing crypto. But think of these more as ephemeral keys. Um, so if I have a ledger that stores all of this information and I can walk that back and prove that these things existed in a point of time, I actually don't need to st store a key, uh, the private key forever. I can actually just throw it away and treat it as an ephemeral object. So um, we do, Fulcio operates in both modes. If you've got your own keys and you wanna use them, great, knock yourself out. If you wanna go to the keyless route, we can support that as well. Um, the, as Dan showed, the email address and the issuer flag are actually show, um, stored as X509 extensions in the certificate. So if you've ever gone through the ASN1 structure and looked through all that stuff, um, they're actually there uh, inside. 
Um, and again, the, the, this root of trust ultimately comes back to understanding when something was signed, who's attesting to the identity, um, and you know, tying that all together so we can actually walk that through. And that's part of what I'll show you in my demo is actually how do we walk and look at these individual fields. But from an architectural perspective, um, we can rely on public uh, open identity uh, providers. Uh, if you have the desire to run your own instance of Fullcio and you want to use a corporate um, OIDC provider, that's totally capable as well. Uh, for the public instance, uh, we're not going to just federate in any single OIDC provider that might be out there in the world. We're going to keep that, that list fairly narrow. Um, but overall, this, this architecture allows us to bind that identity without having to have a key signing ceremony or, or you know, like a little party and, and pull a, build your web of trust that way. We're actually relying on, uh, on these primitives that exist on the internet uh, to make that happen. The second component is the transparency log, or what, what we call Project ReCore. Uh, as Dan mentioned, this is based on the Trillion project uh, from Google, and we've developed what the Trillion developers would call a personality. So this is a REST API that sits on top of that transparency log. It's got a very similar uh, API structure to what the certificate transparency uh, RFC would use. Um, but in essence, this is an immutable ledger. So I can only append new entries to the log, and because it's based on a Merkle hash, I can actually walk the hash chain all the way back to the root uh, to ensure that th if this entry exists in the log, I can cryptographically prove that, that nobody has altered that log um, given the state of the tree at any point in time. Um, one thing to note is that while we are signing artifacts, we're signing containers or blobs, the transparency log does not actually store the blob or the container itself. It is only storing the digest of what it was signed, the signature itself, and then the public key that was used to verify that signature. And ReCore actually does signature verification before ever making an entry into a log. So the things that are in the log um, are, were proven to be, uh, have valid signatures at the time that they were written. Um, now, I said we don't store content. There is, uh, there's two exceptions to that rule. Um, number one, ReCore actually also acts as a uh, timestamp authority. Um, because again, part of unwinding this whole route of trust is just saying I have a signed artifact here is great. But if I don't know when it was signed and who signed it, then that's not enough information to actually make a good decision. So we needed to build that capability in. There's certainly other uh, timestamp authorities out there that you can use, uh, but ReCore acts as one as well. So we store the entire timestamp object in the log. Um, and the other one is for provenance uh, metadata. So when Dan showed kind of the, the long JSON document of all the chains output from, from Tekton chains, that actually is persistent in the log as well. So we're not trying to serve as a new content store for the internet where anything that's signed is downloaded from the log. That's not the intent here at all. Um, only the, think of it as a metadata store for uh, information about the signing and provenance uh, there. Another thing to note is that happens with certificate transparency all the time is there are actually entities that monitor these logs that will sit there and do the, the cryptographic proofs and, and walk that Merkle tree to make sure that nothing's actually been changed. We expose that full information through our API set. We actively encourage people to develop monitors against our public logs. Um, so again, the aim of this is to not just have a central source of truth that only um, you, know, the, the, you know a handful of developers will ultimately maintain a control. This needs to be open and transparent in order for people to trust it. So we need monitors uh, to play that role. Role. Um, so we have uh, Purdue University, a shout out to uh, Professor Santiago from there. Uh, he's had his team working on building a monitor and we're encouraging others to, uh, to build those as well. And then finally, uh, Dan showed off the, the verify capability of Cosign, but um, you know, this is a, uh, think of it as a, a, a Swiss army knife that allows you to do many things, primarily with containers, but it also has some support for blobs as well. This is actually interacting behind the scenes with either key management providers. So if you've used um, you know, KMS from AWS or from Google, uh, this actually can talk to their APIs and, and use those signing systems in addition to having um, native RSA or elliptic curve keys on your desktop, that works as well. Um, and that's also gonna be the, uh, the entity that's uh, contacting and communicating with the OCI registry to actually pull down the container, verify the digest, compute the signature and go back and store uh, you know, that information uh, in, in an artifact in the registry as well. So um, all of these systems are talking to one another, but one point I want you to take away is that this is fundamentally modular. Again, like if you're using AWS, you can use the key management service from there. If you're using Google, these things are very interchangeable, very modular. So we're, again, we're not trying to solve this and you have to only use our tool and nothing else. We realize that that's not probably the most effective path forward. Um, and the last thing that it does is once it signs the, the container, in this case, is actually going to call out to ReCore through the REST API and make the entry in the log and return that back um, as part of the artifact as well. Um, 
For verifying artifacts in, in a transparency log, there's really two ways to do it. One is you can query that log in real time. That's not always practical. So very similar to what's done with SSL certificates is we actually can create uh, what we call a signed entry timestamp. And this is, if you're familiar with certificate stapling, that process is essentially what can be tacked on um, to have a verification or, or, or you know, a cryptographic proof that, hey, this CA issued this certificate at this particular point in time, and I can walk that all the way back without having to make several round trips to a certificate authority as you open your browser. So we do the same exact thing in Cosign. We have that artifact that you can put alongside an artifact in a repository, and you can walk that all offline and still have uh, confidence that, that the entire chain of uh, trust has not been broken. So um, another quick demo here. Uh, I know, again, another spaghetti diagram with lots of moving parts, but I, I do want to kind of walk it through the, through the steps of what does this really look like if you're not using our nice CLI or, you know, in many ways we're using, uh, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants of people that have worked on SSL and many other um, technologies in the past, but trying to tie this together to make this, uh, you know, this process as simple and as easy as we can. So uh, what I'll do is uh, we'll start to, by just creating an ephemeral key, uh, as I mentioned, this kind of keyless mode, um, and then we'll walk that through, create a random blob, we'll sign that blob, we'll push that out to the transparency log. Uh, we'll actually generate a timestamp as well using ReCore, pull all of that together, um, and have that collection of artifacts that then you could store in an OCI registry if you, if you have a container, or you could just put out uh, for folks uh, to download that artifact and to be able to verify that signature uh, going forward. Switch over here. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is generate um, an ephemeral key pair. So I'll just use the uh, elliptic curve DSA algorithm. Um, good practice is to not show your private key um, to the public internet, so I won't actually echo that out here, but if you wanted to see it, it was there. I will show you the public key because obviously without that, um, you're not going to be able to verify the certificate or verify the signature rather. Um, so now we have this public-private key pair. That's great. It has nothing to do with my identity. It's just random, you know, bits off of prime numbers that have been written to the disk. Now I got to have that linkage to who I am as an individual to be able to tie identity uh, to this overall flow. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to initiate an open identity um, flow to actually get an open identity token from a provider, in this case Google, um, and just basically pull that down and store it on my local disk. Our tooling, Cosign, and, and uh, many of our other tools actually automate this all behind the scenes. I'm kind of giving you a what actually happens under the covers look here. So again, it's not this complicated if you use Cosign, but I wanted to kind of show you how all this ties together. So shout out to uh, the folks at Stall, uh, Small Step. They've written a really great CLI for walking these sorts of flows uh, called Step. And so this command is literally just going to reach out to our OIDC provider uh, that we're, we're running a federated provider. Uh, also shout out to the DEX community. So we're actually running an instance of DEX uh, to federate in uh, Google, GitHub, and Microsoft on our public instance. Um, and so what we'll do here is we'll just start that open identity flow um, and when I hit enter here, my browser is going to pop up and it's going to ask me to log in. If you ever have seen one of these, like, log into this website using Google, Facebook, whatever, same exact thing is happening under the covers here. So in this case, I'll choose to log in with Google. I'm, I'm logged in with two different accounts here, one from Red Hat where I work and my own personal Gmail. In this case, I'll sign it with my Red Hat account. I click on that. It says, cool, successful. Come back to the command line. Let's actually look at what is inside of an open identity token. So this is a, a, a JSON web token or JOT as people will uh, informally refer to it as. So the contents of a JOT is just a JSON object that's signed. Um, you've got some information in the header about the algorithm that's used to sign that content. You've got a payload uh, content here. Inside this payload, you've got an actual URL for the issuer that has generated this token. In this case, since we're using a federated identity provider, this is actually the SIGStore OAuth um, is the issuer, but again, this came from Google since it was a federated um, scenario. And again, it's got my email address inside of it here as well. So now I've got some, uh, you know, an entity that, uh, called Google via SIGStore that has attested that Bob Calloway has presented valid tokens, uh, to, you know, valid authentication tokens to me, and I'm willing to generate this token that lives for a very short amount of time that says, hey, this, is, this should be used for uh, any application that comes back to the client ID of SIGStore. Now, obviously, if you're not running SIGStore, then it's worthless to you, but since we are running SIGStore, we're able to use this token to um, 
you call out to Fulcio and get a code signing certificate. So the next thing I'm going to do is actually extract the, my email address from this programmatically, even though I could just probably type it in a more easy fashion. Extract it using uh, JQ and a couple other Bash uh, tricks, and we'll put that into a file. And the, what we'll do now is we'll, we'll start the flow of calling out to the Fulcio component. One thing I need to do is I need to have prove to Fulcio that I have possession of this public and private key pair that I've generated earlier. So the way that I'm going to prove that uh, to Fulcio is I'm actually going to sign this email address, that actual string, using that same private key. So uh, in, to do this, I'm just going to use OpenSSL um, using a, a SHA-256 digest, using my private key, and I'll generate a signature and put that into email.sig. Um, since it's elliptic curve, that takes no time at all, and I'm ready to actually send an API request to Fulcio. We have a, all of our stuff is written through open API, so our, our specs are totally open. We have Swagger interfaces for all of this as well, so if you're curious to see what the interface actually looks like at a, a at HTTP level, all of that's documented on our, on our GitHub site. But since, again, we're doing this through curl and not nice UIs, we're now going to type a very long curl command with inline JSON, setting con content type and accept headers. I would highly recommend you don't do this if you uh, <laughs> don't have to. We'll keep going. And now I'm finally done. And I can type perfectly if you guys haven't noticed. Uh, no mistakes as I go forward here. Um, so now I've called out to Fulcio. Everything's good to go. Let's look at the, uh, the certificate that came back. Oh, you know what? I talked too long, and the token is wasn't valid long enough. So, the joys of internet demos, and we can recreate this very quickly. It's amazing how good I've gotten at this. All right, now let's look at the certificate coming back. All right, so now I see the actual code signing certificate chain that's coming back from Fulcio. Uh, very similar to what Dan showed uh, actually coming out of the log, because again, this is going to be the public key that you're going to pass along to people. Not just the actual uh, EC uh, bits, but actually the, the X509 certificate that has the identity information in it as well. So we have an issuer here of SIGStore. Um, and we have uh, my Red Hat email address that was attested to by Google listed in the certificate. So the next thing I'm going to do really quick is I'm just going to make sure that I can actually verify this, that signed uh, string that's my email address using this code signing certificate, um, because if I can't, then um, something's wrong because the public key should be able to be used. Um, that comes back and says it's verified okay, so we're all good there. And just to be triple sure, um, I'll extract the public key uh, bits out of the code signing certificate and just do a quick diff, and the echo does not return, which means those binary bits are totally equivalent. So now I've got a code signing certificate from Fulcio. I've still got my key pair sitting on my laptop. What do I need to do next? Well, I need something to sign. So let's generate something to sign. Um, we'll just throw 128 random bits into a file, right? And for this case, we'll just keep it simple and, and short and sweet. So. Um, Next thing we'll do is we'll actually call out to OpenSSL, uh, ask it to actually sign it using our private key, um, and we'll store that, uh, dis, uh, that signature in a detached file. So we're not using PKCS bundles, we'll just have this totally separate into a, into a separate file. That's super quick, and just to make sure that everything went well, we'll ask it to verify using our public key that that was all, all good, and it says, yes, we're all good. Um, next thing we'll do is we'll generate a timestamp. And so OpenSSL has a built-in utility to do this. So well, what we'll do is we'll use the actual the detached signature and we'll, we'll attest to, hey, at this particular point in time, this signature was created. So we'll pass that data in um, and we will create a, a, a binary artifact that needs to get sent to the Recore timestamp service. Uh, we'll actually then send that curl over to that um, REST API, just putting that content in the payload. Hit enter, that takes a second to come back. And the next thing we'll do is we'll need to pull down the full certificate chain to be able to verify the signature on the timestamp itself. So we'll, again, call that over the REST API. That works uh, pretty quick. And the next thing we can do is call out over uh, using the OpenSSL tool to verify the timestamp signature. So again, like 
I'm most of the way through my demo, and you guys are probably all like, man, that's a lot of commands, right? I get, this is part of why nobody's signing anything, because this is very complicated in the sequence here. It's easy to mess it up, and if you don't have the, the type, my typing skills, it's easy to make mistakes. So, again, part of echoing this as I go through the rest is, Again, what we're trying to do here is really simplify this and make sure that this is very addressable to developers of any skill set to where ideally if we're doing this the right way, all of this is just hidden behind the scenes and I don't have to think about supply chain providence anymore. I mean, hopefully, you know, we don't have these attacks anymore. We've built this capability into our infrastructure and we can go back to writing code, which is all what we like to do anyway. So we'll verify this timestamp really fast. OpenSSL says that's good. Um, we'll also then just quickly check to make sure that the timestamp that we got back from ReCore um, was actually in the valid um, period for the code signing certificate. So if I scroll back up here, I have a 20 minute window, at least as how we have it coded up right now, um, on today between 1928 and 1948. And at 1930, I've signed this. So for people to go back and walk to make sure, did this person have possession of this key during the, valid, uh, the validity period of the certificate, I now have an artifact that can prove that cryptographically as well. So now I've got all these pieces. I need to put them in the transparency log so I can go back and refer to that in the future. So as I mentioned, Recore's got a REST API that's well documented. Um, again, writing JSON on the command line is really painful, so we'll just do this real quick. And the JSON content here, I'm not trying to just you know move really, really fast here for the sake of time, but we're putting in the signature, we're putting in the public key, and again, Recore needs to verify the signature itself. So you do have to send the artifact that you are signing to Recore so that it can verify the signature against it. Um, but we do not store the artifact in the log at all. So once I call out to Recore, I say, cool, let's actually look at the output that's come back. And with a little bit of uh, JQ trickery, I can now look at the actual object that comes out. It's got a unique identifier. This is the Merkle tree leaf hash for those of you who are Merkle tree fans. Um, and then we have the actual content that's stored here. Uh, we've got a version, we've got a kind. If, you, if you've ever seen the typical, uh, you know, specs for using a CRD in Kube, but this looks and feels much like everything else that is being done these days in cloud native. We've got the hash, we've got the signature, we've got the key. And then finally, as we mentioned, as I mentioned before, we've got this artifact that we can kind of staple on for offline verification. That's what this signed entry timestamp, that's uh, this base 64 encoded stuff. Now, cool, now it's in the transparency log, we're all good. The last thing that I'm gonna show is the inclusion proof. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and compute how, you know, concatenation of SHA hashes for you over and over and over. I'm gonna cheat and actually use our CLI, which renders it in, in a little bit more of a slightly more readable fashion if you walk it all the way back here, but we've got a root hash starting, in four, uh, starting with 4C6, and I can walk all the way from the entry hash going all the way back up to the root of the tree. And if you believe what is being output here at the command line, we get back to the root of 4C6. So now I've got something, I've verified that it's actually been in the log. And last but not least, I can delete my private key because I don't need it anymore. So key management can't get much better than that. So I know that was a ton and we'll actually post all the gist for this as well on a blog post we'll publish uh, after the event. But so if you guys actually wanna manually run through those commands, um, you can be more than happy to do that. So then one, one quick wrap up chart, I know we're about out of time. Uh, in terms of what's next in the six store community, as Dan showed you with the, the stars and the commit track, I mean, it, we have a, an amazing community uh, that are generating PRs left and right. But if I were to break down kind of our roadmap in three different areas, um, signing stuff. We got to sign more things in order for the supply chain to be secure. So we're going to continue to work in the container ecosystem. We're going to continue to work um, with where do you put containers, right? You put it in Kube, you put it in Docker, you put it in Podman, right? We got to make sure that we've got that verification logic built into those systems. And we've also got to realize that this may be a little bit of a bad thing to say at KubeCon, but like containers aren't everything, right? There's actually stuff inside the container like node packages and jars and other things that we need to sign as well. So we're working with those communities uh, to get those artifacts and their distribution systems to actually sign and verify, um, as well as working with policy bundles. Because again, if I've got a ton of signed stuff, that's great, but there's still a big question. Who do you trust? Who do you really trust to put workload into production? So that's where the role of policy ultimately comes in. So we're working with uh, a variety of upstream communities that are, you know, so we shout out to the OPA folks and uh, the Caverno folks and many others that I'm forgetting. Um, but we're working with, uh, with many of those teams to actually prove out that we're, we have that tie back to policy. And then finally, we are running this as a public good service. We, 
Dan alluded to, we want to be the let's encrypt for code signing. And part of that is actually standing up this infrastructure so that people can use it without cost. So we're trying to get these services robust and hardened and audited to where we can be confident that what we're putting into production is something that the community can ultimately trust. And then stand up these additional monitors to where people can verify that and keep us honest as we go forward. So with that, I know we're, we're right at time, but really appreciate everybody's uh, time and attention today. And if to learn more about us, sigstore.dev, uh, same uh, github.com slash sigstore, you can find everything that's going on. We have Slack channels, mailing lists, the whole nine yards. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.